My name is Joseph King. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at WinWire, and welcome to our virtual event, Unleash the Power of Generative AI, Building Intelligent Apps for Tomorrow. Um, we have a lot of information to share, as I mentioned, so I want to first introduce our two presenters. Vineet Arora is a co-founder and CTO of WinWire. And we also have joining us Fouad Koshawi, who is a machine language solutions architect for Microsoft. Um, so we, I'm going to hand it over to Fouad in a second, just so everyone knows the format of how we want to conduct today's discussion. We have four main agenda items. Fouad is going to cover the first two listed there. Uh, if any questions for Foad as he presents, please raise them either in the chat, but we would prefer for you to raise them in the Q&A. And then we will be handing over the second part of today's agenda for Vineet, and we will answer any questions that you may have from Vineet's presentation towards the end. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Foad to get us started. Hey, Joe, thanks for the introduction, everyone. Let me get my screen started in just a second. And I do see um, folks still trickling in. So yeah, we have folks trickling in. So uh, take your time, get your presentation up and running, and then we should be good to go. Awesome. Can you give me a quick thumbs up if you could see my screen? We 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 can. Now it's in presentation mode. Perfect, Fouad. Awesome. So I'll wait for your signal to start. Yeah, why don't we get started? I know we have a lot of material to cover, so please take us, awesome. get us started. Great. Again, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fawad Khashui. Um, I would like to thank the Windwire team, Benit and uh, Joe, for inviting me and having me here at this session. I'm going to talk about the Azure Open AI service and also the applications of the large language model, some of the use cases and current patterns we see here at Microsoft working with multiple customers and also the availability of different services. And towards the end of my presentation for the next, let's say 30 minutes, I'm gonna also take a pause before I hand it back to Vineet um, to answer some of your questions. So uh, happy to uh, engage and answer some of the uh, questions that you might have. So wanted to very briefly talk about all the excitement that's around here. I'm sure you all are aware the AI wave and the new wave of AI is here. Um, all different news outlets are covering it. Our execs are going to 60 minutes for conversations and talks about AI and even our neighbors and everyone is talking and asking about it. So I probably don't need to convince you. AI is all around us and uh, hopefully you have all experienced using uh, either the ChatGPT website or some of the Azure Open AI services for yourselves or maybe you are currently building some new uh, applications. So with that, I'm going to uh, set the stage for our conversation today. Um, a little bit of a history about artificial intelligence it started around 1956, and it's the field of uh, computer science that essentially is trying to mimic human intelligence. Um, we made a lot of progress towards the next 40 years, I would say. Machine learning became an important topic, and it's more focused on uh, detecting patterns. It's a lot of probability and statistics and patterns and identifying those and creating models for that. And we normally use a lot of machine learning models in our daily life and it's so well integrated in our lives that we don't even think about it. That's running in the back end. So when you use your map to get to a destination, that's a machine learning model. When you're using, let's say, Uber to find the driver, that matching process and the pricing is all machine learning, when you're watching shows on your favorite, let's say, platform, next time you go there and it suggests new shows to you, that's another machine learning model. So my uh, hope or my, let's say, um, prediction of uh, our next few years is 
the generative AI becomes part of life so well integrated that we even don't realize or think about it while we are using it. Um, and that's happening to some extent currently. Deep learning became um, a very, very hot topic in the period of around 2015 to 2017. Uh, computer vision, for example, is one of the most significant use cases of that. And you're all familiar with, let's say, Tesla cars who are self-driving, and that's a lot of computer vision models all working in the back end. And another uh, important topic for deep learning was natural language processing. Although we had natural language processing in the works for many years, deep learning gave it a boost and it became much more powerful. Uh, all the great models came out. For example, BERT uh, came out in that area. And the latest wave of technology is generative AI. So generative AI is another subset of deep learning. Um, the models are generative, and I'm sure you're all now by this time super familiar with GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformers, and that's just an architecture of the you know models that made all this new um, capabilities possible. Um, so let's let's take a look at um, some of the new changes or some of the new um you know investments that are happening currently we we do see 2x uh, more investments um private investment in ai during the past year uh, 5x more research in ai fairness um since 2014 and that's an important topic i'm going to talk about it and i i know vinit is going to also talk about it as well and 50% of the organizations that have been surveyed here have at least one form of AI in their business area. So, so that's all very exciting. There is a lot more room to uh, improve and add to the capabilities and add additional workloads. But I think the point is to um, to he here is to show that the of the AI is everywhere. Let's briefly talk about our partnership with OpenAI. Um, as you all probably know, OpenAI, great company, uh, mostly focused on research and building the latest and greatest models. Like we started earlier this year releasing DaVinci type of family of models, and then the chat GPT family of models, or as we call it, GPT 3.5 Turbo, and then GPT 4. Um, Microsoft is in partnership with OpenAI. We worked at engineering level with them, but also we bring the latest models to Azure um, and serve them in Microsoft at scale and security and privacy of a cloud company like Microsoft. So that, that's the partnership and that's how we add value working with OpenAI and bringing those models and serving it end to end to our own customers. Um, families of models, I kind of alluded to, to the left is GPT-3 family of models, and it had multiple variations. The smallest model was called, or is called, Ada. And then the next one is Babbage, Curie, and Da Vinci. Um, I like to kind of memorize them with A, B, C, and D. So that's text-to-text -text based model. Uh, you would be able to um, prompt it. Uh, and then get some responses back. Um, chat GPT and GPT-4 are conversational. I'm sure you have all probably seen chat GPT or you might have used chat GPT so far. And GPT-4 is the greatest and latest model that's been released. Although they are conversational, you could still ask them to, let's say, summarize text for you or maybe classify text. So the format is conversational, correct? That's the understanding. But I just want to maybe point out and clarify that you could still ask them for specific language tasks as well. Codex, family of models that's been fine-tuned towards code, and that's been satisfied as part of the GitHub Copilot. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You would be able to generate SQL, Python, C, or any language that you're working on, part of the Codex family of models. And DALI is a text-to-image um model so let me go to the next slide we have provided a few examples here 
To the left, for example, I'm asking GPT-3 to provide a tagline for an ice cream shop so it can answer that, it can be creative, but also I can ask it for specific tasks to either classify some sentence or maybe a conversation or summarize it. The conversational one for chat GPT and GPT-4, you'll be able to prompt it and get responses back. And for Codex, we briefly discussed it. I could provide a table, for example, if it's SQL, for example, I could provide the uh, schema and maybe create a SQL query for it. So, and then it would be able to generate the code for me. And we'll see that how it's been implemented in GitHub Copilot as well as our own product. And DALI would be able to generate images. So you would be able to provide a prompt describe what you need and get the responses. And I'm sure you have seen so many nice pictures probably generated by DALI. I just wanna um, have a few examples here for you to, to see the capabilities of these models and how good they are at generating context. Uh, the other point is to maybe solidify here that these are not images that have been available previously, let's say on the web, or the this is not a search engine essentially. An astronaut on a horse or teddy bears sitting on Earth using a computer, these are original images being generated every time you prompt a model as a new model, so as a new image. So, so just to maybe prove that point and show you the capabilities here, a few fun examples provided. This is an important slide i would say or a great slide here to to show you where we see azure open ai service fits within our stack of technology um we think of azure open ai service as another first party azure service that's available to you in addition to all the other great services that we have in order to build an end-to-end -end solution and let me start from the bottom um our machine learning platform called Azure Machine Learning. It's a cloud platform for building machine learning models. And why that's important to mention? Because I know uh, everyone is now also thinking about open source models. So for example, we, uh, we are providing a lot of different open source models, or if you are building, let's say, more traditional machine learning models for regression or classification or whatnot, all of that can be done in Azure Machine Learning. That's our platform at the base. And many of the workloads that, or let's say all the workloads that we serve as well as Microsoft is running in Azure Machine Learning. So that's another, I would say, um, testament to, to Azure Machine Learning's capabilities where we're serving this at scale to our own customers. The next layer of the stack is our, um, cognitive services or customizable AI models. For example, we have vision, speech language decision, and Azure Open AI service. That's that's a powerful language service, and that sits in, uh, in the second layer of the stack. We have scenario-based services. Most importantly, or currently, the emerging one is cognitive search. For those of you who are already familiar, um, the lar large language models currently have to work with a search engine or a retrieval process. And there are multiple, multiple, um, let's say startup companies and multiple methods. Everyone is trying to do the best retrieval um, they can and achieve that. Cognitive ser search is available to you in Azure. You could index your um, documents or databases and also natively supports vector search because that's another important topic for large language models so essentially cognitive search provides all the capabilities needed for it to work with a large language model and that's super scalable and easy uh, easily plugs in with within the azure open ai service next layer of the stack the power bi and power apps and power automate and virtual agents and lastly the microsoft 365 and dynamics so just to put it in perspective, if you need to build a full end-to-end -end solution, you might need to mix and match some of these services, connect them to each other, and then you'll have the full architecture in production. But I know we have been talking about co-pilots, and that's a term that's been coined recently. 
and that there is an intention behind it. We're building all these models and all these systems as a co-pilot. The human is the pilot, and this is a co-pilot helping the human make better decisions more efficiently. And the co-pilots, the era of co-pilot is here. Co-pilots have a few uh, specific characteristics to them. So co-pilots are conversational. You would be able to seamlessly interact with them and talk, or let's say chat with them, in order to uh, take your uh, you know, request in the language, whatever it is, it can be English or other languages, and then in the back end, translate it or use it to either run something or use or uh, you know provide you some information so so the most important part is they are conversational they would be able to interact very easily with humans um the co-pilots are powered by foundation models um foundation models as you know they are either the large language models or the llms or the multimodal models like the models like gpt4 uh, as you know uh, has the capability to have both input at images and text. Um, currently, the version that's available in Azure is only text-based, but that's that's going to become available in the future as well. But the capability is there. Um, the other important topic, which I kind of already mentioned as well, is you could augment these co-pilots, which are essentially smart um, agents with other skills or tools. You could provide them access, let's say, to a web search. For example, let's say a copilot or a large language model is very intelligently interacting with you, but doesn't know how's the weather today in Tokyo. If you provided the skills or capabilities to connect with other tools like a calculator or a web search, or let's say a database that it can retrieve information from, let's say you have a huge data set of all the interactions of or all the transactions of your sales, um, the copilot or the large language model wouldn't necessarily know how much you had, how much sales you had last month. But if you give it the tools and access, it could go and query that database and provide that information to you. So essentially, um, the plugins or the skills or all these additional auxiliary, let's say, capabilities that give Copilot the access, and the Copilot would be the agent, or the large language model here would be the agent that's deciding when to use these skills and tools. And that's kind of similar to humans. Let's say you hire a new uh, person at your company. They might be very well educated, they know a lot of things, but still they might not know all the details about your company, or they might need ha have access to search the web or stack overflow to maybe clarify a few things so so that's that i would say the same mentality and then the last thing is co-pilots are aware of the environment and they they understand the context without being told explicitly so with that background i want to maybe also point out at microsoft we are we are taking these uh generative ai technologies in two aspects First one is we are using generative AI to augment and infuse our own products and uh, add capabilities to them. So we have a suite of different products, including the GitHub, or for example, our Windows or M365, which is the stack of um, PowerPoint and Outlook and Word, or Power Platform, or for example, the Power BI and Fabric. So these are all our own products. We are infusing them with AI and with Power with uh, Copilot capabilities, and they're they are in different stages. GitHub Copilot has been released and it's available. Some of them are in private preview. The demos are available. So in different stages of release, they're all available to some extent currently. And as a cloud company. Um, we are also providing the capability um, to our customers to, to use generative AI and build uh, their own applications and take dependency on it and build your own uh, services as well. So, so in two regards, you can look at it. If th there is a specific uh, product that helps solve your business problems, definitely you could use any of these um, products but also if you need to build and augment your 
own products where there isn't a specific, let's say, business problem, you could use Microsoft Cloud and we serve this as Azure OpenAI service for you to be able to pretty much build your own Copilot as well. I want to drill down a little bit on GitHub Copilot and provide you an example here. Um, GitHub Copilot offers code suggestions. So it's essentially like an assistant where it's helping you to write code and it uh, increases the efficiency of your developer teams. It would be able to convert comments to code or autofill repetitive code parts or show alternatives. It can generate unit testing and it can generate uh, documentation for your code. So here is a little example here. Someone is uh, only providing, let's say, the function name and what they need from the function. And as soon as they finish that and they press tab, uh, you would see the code being generated by the copilot. So I'm going to take a pause there for you to take a look. As you can see, uh, the comment is only being written on line 27, and the rest is being generated by, by the system. So we have already incorporated generative AI in copilot here in GitHub, and that's available as a you know product available. Currently, you could simply start using it as part of your GitHub suite. I want to uh, make a transition here to another important topic uh, about responsible AI. Um, while we are developing these technologies, they are very exciting, life-changing, and very important to all of us as humanity. But at the same time, Microsoft is very, very um, mindful and proactively uh, working on the responsible AI topics as well. So we formed the Office of Responsible AI back in 2016 and 17, I think, and uh, they started looking into different principles, um, different uh, aspects of responsible AI, and they identified six different dimensions to it. Privacy and security, inclusiveness, accountability, transparency, fairness, and reliability and safety, are the six different um, guiding uh, rules for us. And based off of that, we have created a lot of trainings and practices and tools and processes. So for large language models specifically, we have a content uh, safety system where it would um, detect uh, harmful language, both on the input and on the output, as we call it on the prompt and then the response. And it's constantly and continuously monitoring the prompt and responses in order to stop any harmful language. And um, we can discuss that further, but just wanted to put that in perspective here. And that's an important topic, I would say, for anyone who's building new systems in order to be able to scale it responsibly. Always get a lot of questions about your data, the security of your data. Um, so I just wanted to maybe clarify a few things here. Um, maybe you have heard some stories or maybe you have read some news articles about uh, some issues about data. Maybe that, that those articles are more relevant to the public facing websites, but this is a cloud service on Azure. So, so the instance of um, GPT models that you create on Azure, this is safe. This is to the highest standards of data and privacy, and your data is yours. So the data is encrypted, it's stored in your Azure subscription. The data is not used to train foundation models, either Microsoft or OpenAI. We are not using the data and data is yours. Actually, OpenAI is a separate entity. Although they run on Azure, they are a separate entity from Microsoft. So we are serving these models in our own data centers separate from them. We only take the model weights and the model from them, and we serve it in our own um, you know, data centers. And your data is protected by the most comprehensive enterprise compliance security controls. It's um, in compliance with SOC 2 and HIPAA and the rest of the you know, compliance um, available normally for any other Azure service. So just want to point that out. If anyone has a question, I'm happy to answer that after the call or um, 
you know, towards the end here or uh, separately offline. But but the the security and privacy is in top of mind conversation for us with all our customers, and we have a lot of uh, good answers, and everything is already been taught up. So that that's a little bit about the trust and safety I wanted to point out. And I wanted to uh, in the end here, just to summarize all the different use cases. So uh, we have so far identified four buckets of use cases for, for this technology in Azure OpenAI. Um, and these are the ones that we see as patterns working with customers. But I would invite you all to think about all the different aspects of your business that this can fit into. Maybe we haven't identified it here, but I would definitely ask you to, to be uh, very creative about the different ways this technology can help your business. To the left is content generation. It can generate responses to customers, generate personalized uh, websites, or maybe chat with someone and generate a lot of different uh, content for marketing and so on and so forth. The next use case is summarization, and that's a huge use case. It can summarize knowledge bases, conversations between a customer and an agent, or summarize, let's say, documentation. For example, you have some PDFs or maybe some um, you know, financial documents that you want to summarize, and that's another great use case. Code generation we discussed. Um, it can generate SQL and Python and so on and so forth code, and it's already been sassified and it's part of our GitHub Copilot offering. And then semantic search, which I already uh, mentioned, these language models would work great with uh, a semantic search or with a search engine helping them retrieve information. And we call that architecture RAG, which stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So you could think of the first use case, the content generation to the left and semantic search working together uh, in conjunction. Uh, the semantic search or the search bringing the right context, either from a database or from the web, and then the content generation can be personalized or can be more specific and tailored. Given that information, it can interact with the user and respond to their questions and queries. Um, so I want to maybe take a pause here. Uh, I know Vineet is going to talk about all these different use cases and demo them in details as well and uh, provide you a lot more, I would say, um, context uh, on how, how these use cases can go into production and at scale. Um, I'm going to take a pause here, uh, see if there are any questions from the chat or anything, Joe, that you might uh, have um, you know, observed that folks are asking, and I'd be happy to answer that. Yeah, thanks, Vlad. I do have a couple questions here, so let's let's get to them. The first question is, how will code generation work? What information should be sourced to it? Can it come from a DB, Power BI, data models? Um, large language models have been trained on large amounts of text, and that includes text from code as well. So. Out of the box, they are already familiar with code generation and with with many different languages. So they probably don't need much more um, training there. Unless I've seen some use cases that it has been a very, very specific code language that's proprietary to a specific customer. That one LLM might need a little bit more help, but I, I would say like out of the box, these models would be able to generate code. And this has already been uh, become, I mean, this is already part of our GitHub Copilot offering. So I would definitely suggest or encourage you to all test the GitHub Copilot and if, see if it works, you'd be able to uh, simply use it and it doesn't take any um, development cycles out of, uh, out of your time. So it's already been, yeah. Great. Thanks, Fouad. I have another sure. question here from Anita asking you to kind of elaborate on, on the responsible a AI part of your presentation. Her question is, as we know, Microsoft aligns with the responsible AI principle to protect the users from abusive content. 
but how does Microsoft handle this without exposing the client's information to Microsoft? Because as you know, organizations have their proprietary data processes, et cetera. Sure, and that, that's an important topic. Uh, just to briefly maybe answer that is, these language models um, are a sync process. So you're calling the API and you're getting the response back. In, at the same time, we have a sync process with them where we are running a, another model. Let's say it's a deep learning model, which, which is monitoring the text that goes in and out and classifying it for harmful language. And that's a sync process. So nothing is being stored or nothing being exposed to Microsoft or others. At the same time, this API call is being generated. That model also is being called both on the prompt and then the response in order to classify and stop harmful language. So again, in this process, nothing is being exposed to Microsoft. Um, there is another third process, I would say, that's called abuse monitoring. And that is storing data and retaining data for up to 30 days. And that's only being retained and stored for responsible AI topics. Nothing is being used by Microsoft or others and nothing being shared with anyone. In case abuse is happening, someone from Microsoft, an authorized employee of Microsoft would be able to go and check and maybe have a conversation with our customers. And there are ways to also opt out of that data retention process for a specific use cases that we have listed. But uh, I'm happy to take that conversation further with, uh, with, with you know, with you all to to clarify things because that's an important topic that takes maybe uh, a session on itself. We could do it separately. Great, yeah. Shameless plug. We are actually um, going to be planning um, a webinar. Um, so stay tuned uh, on this very topic to dive deeper into responsible AI. So we'll uh, we'll um, be um, putting that out for everyone to uh, continue that conversation with us in the future. Awesome. Great. Okay. Um, why don't we just for the sake of time transition to Vineet? Um, I see there are a few other questions. We'll get to them. Um, but I want to make sure we allow Vineet some time to kind of pick up the conversation from where you left off, Oed. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Great. Vineet, uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, and Joe, I appreciate uh, you coordinating all this. Uh, folks, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some of you if you're joining from other part of the world. Um, Fouad uh, covered a bit of topics which are very, very important for the Microsoft uh, OpenAI platform. And I hope uh, you got a good sense of what are the capabilities of the platform, what all it can do. Uh, as Fouad mentioned, and as Joe uh, touched upon in the beginning, what I'm going to do is um, you know, take the next 30 minutes or so, uh, talk to you about use cases, uh, you know, implementing those. You know, uh, we as a company which works with customers and implementing solutions. We have, of course, looked at various use cases where uh, actual implementation of these technologies are possible. Uh, I will have a lot of demos where uh, most of the uh, effort will be uh, spent on showing you capabilities that are possible with OpenAI that you can use to build your own uh, solutions. Uh, that's the focus area. As you saw for our talk about use cases uh, which OpenAI enables, but how do companies look at adopting these technologies uh, right in their organization? This is just a quick sort of a high level 50,000 feet uh, perspective on the roadmap that I see uh, various organizations taking uh, as they embark on this journey to adopt uh, Azure OpenAI and generative AI technologies overall, right? You saw you saw text-based, image-based, apps-based, co-pilots, all of that. Um, many companies are today that we speak to are in this initial stage of what we call as the envisioning phase, right? They are envisioning what is possible, what are the various 
scenarios that we need to look at it. Uh, you know, Microsoft, us, we do envisioning sessions. We help customers think through uh, many of the scenarios that they are thinking about and how the technology can actually enable that. Uh, you know, do some prioritization of the use cases and then move on to a very core st stage uh, of what we call as intelligent cloud apps. And that's where I'm going to spend, uh, you know, majority of the rest of the time to show you what are the building blocks, uh, right? How do you enable intelligent cloud apps that are infused with Gen AI uh, capabilities, right? That's where you are leveraging the technologies that Fouad talked about, and we are able to you know, uh, emphasize on that. Moving on to a larger enterprise deployment, right? As organizations are getting the feedback from employing some of these solutions, uh, experimenting with them, understanding the capabilities, how it works on their data uh, in a secure manner, setting up the security, I think the ultimate goal is to make it so prevalent that it becomes a part of your typical software development life cycle that generative ai is core and essential to like today we build every app and every app has to have a mobile version right be it responsive be it a mobile app or anything else it's not it's not an afterthought what it was probably five seven years back uh, right, it is an essential capability for every solution that you're developing, and I see the co-pilot kind of uh, approach using the generative AI technologies is going to enable that itself. Is that in your design, in your planning of the applications for your enterprise or for your products that you're taking to the customers, right? How do you incorporate those generative AI? And I have a quick sort of a a uh, sample of those that I will show you, and we'll talk more about the co-pilot specifically uh, in the next week that we are doing a very focused webinar. Just a couple of more uh, information. Um, I'm sure you folks are from different organizations and different departments within those organizations. When you look at scenarios like uh, you know different departments, how do they use it? These are some of the top use cases that we have come across uh, from anything from content creation to risk assessment, doing some legal research, right? Uh, the idea is saving time. The idea and the capability is enabling productivity. How do you make sure that these technologies that we're talking about are not just um, for, 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 the, for the sake of just having those chat-based interface, but how do you actually incorporate them into your enterprise solutions so they really have benefits of saving time, saving cost, and increasing productivity? I want to just bring up this one slide, um, you know, where um, Gartner, as you all of you know, this is Gartner's recommendation on some of the best practices as organizations start to look at uh, putting these technologies in their solutions, right? Um, we, of course, you know, partner very closely with Microsoft as the platform provider, but analysts like Gartner to make sure that we uh, take these suggestions, guidance to our customers also. But if you look at some of the key uh, items, like when you're building a solution, you have to ensure transparency that whatever is the solution is actually generative AI. It's it's actually a machine behind it, right? Yes, it can respond a lot more like a human, but ensuring that transparency is very, very important because of all the responsible AI and ethical uh, elements that we talked about. Setting up processes and guardrails to track biases, issues of trustworthiness, right? Because that, that's where probably one of the shortcomings that we'll see or, or, or the or the uh, adoption challenges that we'll see is people will not be able to say, uh, it sounds like human, but how do I trust that this output is good, right? So you have to make sure there is a human angle involved into it. There are tools and technologies that are coming into it, which we'll talk about in our next session, as Joe mentioned, uh, around responsible AI in a few weeks from now, uh, that are going to help you enable that. Um, very critical is how do you put guardrails that sensitive data, right? And I believe there was a question around that, right? Is neither inputted 
not derived out, how do you put those kinds of filters? And I'll, I'll show you the tools uh, for that after this. Um, I think there is this, um, you know, old saying for many, many years that uh, keeping uh, labeling uh, any solution as beta version, right? Um, you know, sets the expectations very well. So it's not like we are in a hurry to go into production, but beta means because the technology itself is evolving, the solution that are built on those technologies will continue to evolve. So rather than take the, um, you know, uh, feedback from a customer that, oh, this is not mature, I'm not going to start using it. I think the idea should be is you build a solution and say it is going to evolve over time uh, because the technology, underlying technology itself is evolving, right? Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, the key point is, um, you know, start by testing extensively with some key stakeholders, with friendlies uh, that you're looking at. And that's what we see working with our customers is that there is a lot and lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, experimentation that needs to come in for people to really feel good about the whole solution. As I was talking about that, and I have a screenshot, but I'll I'll jump to the actual demo. Um, you know, in the Azure Open AI, if you have already been working, if you have access to those services, one of the key guardrails uh, is what is called Content Safety Studio. Uh, right, I'm sure you have seen enough demos of the Azure OpenAI Studio. I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, you know, if you there are enough videos out there on the on the web, uh, Microsoft has uh, done that. But this is a relatively newer topic, um, and I know there was a question um, that I that I came across uh, when Fuad was presenting around quotas also. So maybe I'll try to address both of them together. Let me switch over to a, a demo screen and answer both uh, that question and give you some idea about how uh, in an Azure OpenAI solutions, some bit of that guardrails are being provided by the solution. So this is my um, Azure AI Studio. Uh, this is something that I'm assuming if you have access to it, you all have been looking at it. What you will see is a new um, item out here in the left side called quotas. And this is where, you know, this is the quota that has been allocated to you based upon different kind of models that you have. These are the three models that I have deployed in Winwire, right, uh, that, that we have. And what it is telling me is that there are quotas specific to each of those models that are automatically allocated, right? These are the token limits and usage limits that it is being talked about. Now, as you see this sort of the icon, you may have a need, you could request more tokens, you could request uh, increase in this quota. That is right now on Microsoft's uh, uh, prerogative that they will analyze the request, analyze the situation, and then be able to uh, you know, address that particular request. So I hope that gives that idea to uh, the gentleman who had asked that question about the quota. Um, you know, more information can be provided uh, by Microsoft too. Uh, right. I just wanted to show you that if you have access to this, you can manage this quotas out here. The second thing that I want to talk about is content filters. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the capability for any solution to make sure, uh, you know, the capabilities are there. But how do you ensure that the biases, the um, unethical content is neither being inputted nor being outputted? Uh, this is a preview version of uh, or a preview feature that is uh, part of the Azure AI Studio uh, where you can actually create a content filter, right? And you can give it a name. And what you will see is both input when you are doing a user prompt, right? You have four different levels, uh, sorry, three different levels for four different severities of hate, either sexual, self-harm or violence related content based upon your usage scenarios what is your threshold you can say i'm not going to accept any of these you know the, the low is my threshold or it is fine uh, it is not fine for me to have any content related to hate any content related to sexual in prompts that are coming in or the same thing output in 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 the different forms once you set up this, like I've set up this con uh, content filter, right? Uh, I've just set it up for different severities. Uh, the models that you have deployed, right? 
you will be able to link it to that particular model, which is the content filter that you want to use. So as you will see, you can deploy multiple models. You can deploy multiple content filters for your different scenarios. For example, HR may have a different need, right? Finance may have a different need. Uh, your marketing department may have a, a much more higher threshold. You will be able to you know, have different models, different content filters, uh, you know, set up in 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 your environment so that it is actually you know meeting your particular requirements. So each of these models, these are the some models that we have deployed. We are able to link it to which is the content filter that is addressing that. So that is uh, an important element around content security. Uh, you know, it's part of the content safety studio. Um, actually, let me let me um, go back to the demo. So while I see that as a part of the content safe content uh, filters as a part of the AI studio itself, Microsoft has also provided a, a detailed content safety portal, which is more for you to again experiment and learn from not only text but images and multi-model content. So if you were to look at same kind of a settings and try out some of those things. This is the playground where you can understand it and it'll tell you what all is possible, what all is not possible. You have lots of um, uh, capabilities to look at uh, testing with large data sets. How do you upload it? And, and I'm not going to spend too much time right now on this, but as I said, we'll be covering more on this, but this is a very, very powerful uh, capability that is uh, part of the uh, entire tools and suite that Microsoft is providing for OpenAI. As I said, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so, um, you know, uh, 20 to 25 minutes on, on doing some demos. Uh, the demos that I want to talk about are uh, some of these applications. Um, I will I will bring up this slide back again, but if you have your um, phones handy, if you want to point your camera to the QR code, you know, you will see WinWire has been at the forefront of building many, many uh, different solutions. Um, and Microsoft has a Azure marketplace where these solutions are published. Um, you know, there's too much to consume, but whichever one you are more in interested in, you'll be able to go into the benefits, the approach for it, and be able to contact us uh, on uh, looking at implementing that solution in, in your organization. Um, as I said, I have also deployed all these solutions in a demo portal that we host uh, at WinWire. Uh, this is uh, you know just a screenshot. I'll go to the actual uh, portal. All these use cases uh, are available, and I want to show you three demos to start with, uh, right? Um, how we look at these as building blocks, right? One of the most important one, I believe, there was another question around uh, code processing, right? I want to talk about code processing and code documentation generation, because this is something that is very, very powerful as a part of the capability that the platform provides. So this is the solution, as I talked about, um, you know, this is the uh, portal that where we have hosted all these uh, applications. For the sake of time, I have uh, uh, opened some of the uh, applications already. Uh, this is a solution that is a demo solution. That's what you need to understand, right? This is not a complete enterprise solution, but I'm just showing you the capability of what is possible that you can actually then look at and build solutions using some of these solution accelerators as we talk about it. Let me, before that, go to, um, I've opened a few of the uh, C-sharp files, uh, you know, one HTML file that I have as a part of a complete global web app that you see out here, right? And yeah, if I look at the code, you know, there is there is a lot for me to probably understand. As some of you know, understanding somebody else's code is probably one of the most difficult tasks that is there. What we have done is we have looked at a scenario where I can actually upload these files. Again, these are transient for the uh, reason. Um, or I can actually even point it to a Git repo, right? If you have it, if you want to document the entire Git repo. For the demo sake, I'm just going to pick up a couple of files uh, and let me just go to code, the global web app that I was showing you. Um, and I'm going to pick up one of the controllers that I have it open. Uh, let's say the login controller. 
Uh, what we have done is, you know, you can actually process any of these different kinds of files. It could be uh, a C sharp or any of these other files, including Java, including some of the legacy code like Kabul, which of course, you know, nobody documented. Uh, and what you can do is generate technical documentation, generate test cases, maybe look at understanding the logic of the code. Maybe that's what is more interesting for me. Let me just look at, okay, I saw that C sharp file, right? But let me just see too many demo gods have to be friendly to me. Let's see if it generates the technical documentation. What it's basically doing is, is I'll show you the architecture diagram, but the I'm in this case, I'm just for the demo sake, I'm picking up one C sharp file code file, which I showed you in Visual Studio uh, while that is happening, right? I'm showing the login controller, right? And it's it's not documented very well. There are no comments in the doc in the code. Uh, some code is commented actually, but the 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 the, the description is not there uh, uh, for for a lot of this, right? What the application is going to do is understand this code, right? And create a documentation that is more formal about what this what this application is uh, doing or what this this particular piece of code is doing. But as I said, you could point it to an entire Git repo also, right? So what it does is it says, uh, this resides within a controller namespace. And again, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but it gives description for each of the method that is there uh, and explains it to me in in clear terms. OK, what is it that that particular piece of code is doing? As I talked about, and I will see if uh, it doesn't fail this time, I could also look at generating test cases for this particular code, right? So OK, I understood the code. I have a documentation. I can save the documentation. I can provide it to my business analysts. I could provide it to my even even uh, other developers who are trying to understand what this code is doing. But what about my QA folks, right? Um, what if the QA folks need to understand the code that may have been written years ago or you know, even even a few months ago, right? Can I generate test cases uh, for uh, looking at those. And this is again. Saving time. Saving productive uh, um, ensuring that you know you have some productivity, right? Uh, for any of this uh, applications. I do see a, a question around security and privacy while this thing is happening, so I'll, I'll probably address that because it's very, very relevant. Um, you know, as I think Fuad was talking about, and if I, OK, it's generated, let me just show you this. Uh, right, pre-login method, it knows that there is no test data, right? Uh, you know, for some of the other ones, it knows what is the test data, what should you expect? Now, this is guidance. This is generation of information, guidance, right? Just the basic test cases, which are, which are, which are going to save time. But what if I want to actually generate, right, script for maybe Selenium, right? That's what probably, a lot of uh, organizations use. Uh, let me make sure I spell that correctly. It is correct, but let's do that. What I'm doing in this particular case is again looking at an opportunity to save some time uh, where it could actually look at the code and generate some script for me, which I can use in my Selenium code. Again, I can't want to continue to emphasize that I'm right now doing it for one file. I could have pointed it to my entire Git repo and it will do it in an iterative fashion for the entire uh, repo and all the C sharp or all the whatever code files are out there. It'll be able to address that, right? The point that I was saying is how is the security and the privacy maintained for any data or code shared with the Azure AI platform? Uh, I will also have Fuad give uh, the Microsoft um, you know, perspective on that. But just to show you whatever I'm uploading out here, right? I'm not actually storing it out here. I'm actually generating it in uh, all this in real time. And it is all happening within your own Azure tenant. As Fuad mentioned, he had one slide where he emphasized on your data is your data. You're not getting this data that you're sending for processing being sent to other customers or in a public domain right uh, that is very very important and uh, for if you want to give your perspective 
while while I show this. So what it generated and probably saves uh, you know a, a QA engineer lots of time um, that you know uh, it generated a complete script. Uh, I, I, I want to echo that. Yeah, I wanted to echo the sentiments beneath that you mentioned, and I saw a few questions in the chat regarding this topic as well. You're uh, absolutely correct. Um, if there is some data like that needs to be stored, customers can have and a storage account within their own subscription as like any other storage account that they already probably are using. They can pull data out of the storage account, call the API for Azure OpenAI, the Azure OpenAI, service is stateless it's not storing it's not learning and it's not taking out any data from your calls so you call the api you get the results back and then the results are back to you you can do whatever additional steps need to be done if you want to store the results you can still store it in a storage account within your own subscription so so in this process nothing is being retained or stored by microsoft i i made the exception for responsible ai there is there is an exception to that some the but but we can have that discussion. That's that's again only for the purpose of responsible AI. Otherwise, all your data is yours, stays in within your storage accounts, whatever service you are using, it's within your own tenants and subscriptions. So I'm gonna pause here, pass it back. Absolutely. To you. Thank, no, you. thank you. Thank you again for for that. And again, as you saw, um, I was just I just uh, you know switched over for a quick second. Uh, right, we are not using any database or anything in 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 the. This is the entire uh, you know um, Azure OpenAI related uh, resource group where all my applications that I'm showing you are hosted, right? And they are processed in real time. And even this output is not stored anywhere, right? We can download this report, right, for processing for saving. We can automate this when we do it into production, right? But it's not that Azure OpenAI services is retaining this content for anything else. And yes, there was another question which has already been answered. None of this data is being used for training uh, the models at all. This is uh, working in your scenario and the data is not used for training any other particular models. Another interesting thing that um, uh, and we'll take more questions uh, because we have time. Another interesting scenario that we see is there's a lot of legacy code, uh, right, that is existing, right? And if I just take data controller in this particular case, which I again had it open out here uh, as, as a complete simple, okay, this looks like very complex for me. I don't understand it. I'm probably a data scientist, uh, right? And what I want to do is, oops, sorry. I want to actually uh, say, OK, maybe give me this code in Python, right? Now, imagine if you do find a developer or an engineer, right, who understand both C-sharp and Python. It may still take the person, right, some time to understand the entire code and actually convert this into the Python, assuming that the person is aware of both the technologies and both the uh, both the both the platforms, right? Here, what I'm trying to show you is a simply uh, again a demo, right? But this can be run in a factory mode. You have tons of files of any code, and you want to convert it into a different code, right? You will be able to automate that entire process using the generative AI technologies behind the scenes. So this is generation, as I talked about, generation of a newer content that it is happening by taking some existing content, right? And not like chat GPT where you ask something, yes, it generates contents, but you are you're doing more of a chat interface. Here I'm taking uh, some existing content, you know, processing it in this particular case, code related processing and generating new content itself. What you will see as the output comes in and I'm continuing to talk because it's, going, it's taking a few seconds. Here you go, right? It gives you even guidance around that, right? That Python does not have an inbuilt support for MVC architecture. If some of you know model view uh, um, controller architecture, right? It does not have it. So code is a bit different, right? Now, it's not entirely that I copy paste and then suddenly my code will run. A human being is still required. A, a, a engineer will still need to look at it, right? And it's suggesting to you, you may want to look at Django or, or Flask to achieve the same functionality. 
it has given you a complete code for whatever I think it was 400 lines of code or something in Python, right? With some guidance around it. It's not just completely uh, runnable, but at least it's um, uh, imagine the kind of time saving it can achieve if you have hundreds and thousands of files of legacy code and, and ap application that you have particular uh, built. Right. These are these are some of the scenarios that I wanted to show you. Um, you know, we, we have talked about uh, processing code for understanding the logic, BA, right? Maybe even looking for defects, right? Uh, let's see if, if it finds any particular defects. Maybe it will find, maybe it will not find any particular defects. These are very, very useful scenarios for saving a lot of time and increasing productivity during the entire process. While this is happening, I'll come back to that. I, I want to go back to the uh, deck and and talk about uh, you know what the the second scenario, analyzing. Uh, I believe there was a question in the earlier part of the uh, webinar where we were looking at maybe database related information. Now today. You have to understand Azure OpenAI services is just one of the core services which is enabling all the generative AI capabilities, right? Uh, there are other services that you will have to use and provide these particular solutions like connecting to the database, right? Um, now, what I have done for demo sake is I have generated, a, you know, sort of a text file, a former separated value file, as you can understand, uh, right? For from assuming it is from a database. Right, you could do the same thing. It's all dummy data. Uh, I'm not doing anything. Uh, no proprietary data of any case. Uh, and while I do that, uh, before I do that, right, this is it's not possible to identify any concrete work, works, but it is intelligent enough to tell you that they seem to have similar condition checks. It'll be a, a better to extract this into. I mean, think of this as a part of your if you have in your organization something like an architectural review board for your code, for your application, for your solutions, how much starting point can it, this particular thing provide to you, right? Uh, it's also telling you exception handling is done by simply throwing an exception back to the caller. It will be better to handle exceptions. These kinds of guidance, these kinds of things, you can even incorporate your own, um, you know, um, your own uh, processes, what are the various things? It's even giving you some sample code and everything else out there. Let me go back to the data processing that I was talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick up that. Uh, the code. I have that. CSV file that I have uploaded uh, or, or downloaded, actually not uploaded, uh, right? Marketing data, right? And what I'm going to be able to do is like, this is again a demo in an entire solution. You will automate this entire process of extracting data, querying the database, you know, uh, bringing the data and then say, which is the most uh, successful campaign, right? That's it. I'm not asking it anything else. It knows it's a marketing data. It has some campaign data, right? It has, it has, you know, I will continue to try. Make sure that we are able to. Please the marketing gods or uh, demo gods in this case. As you can see, there was a question about quotas, right? Uh, and so, something around this, this these errors are because uh, a lot of probably testing is happening. So uh, the important point is again uh, going back to there's a lot of data. If a human being looks at it, yeah, I can do a, I can write a SQL query and understand, um, you know, do some filtering, do some grouping, and everything else. But here, it's able to give me a quick snapshot by analyzing the data and say campaign 20, which is right at the end, right, has probably you know, the most successful campaign. It has the highest ad impression, ad clicks, website visits, blah, 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 right? I could also ask it, okay, what is the most popular channel, right? Now, uh, if you look at the 
camp in the, the, the titles of the columns, right? There is nothing called channel out here. Let's see what it does. What it is, oops, uh, did I select the file or not? Let's see. Right. So it is making sure that, you know, it seems you gave me a lot of data about different marketing campaign. The most popular channel, we would typically like this, 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 right? It is, does not have the channel information, but it's able to give you an intelligent answer, right? What is it the metric that you like to determine to, pop, to uh, determine the popularity of the channel? Right, that's what is very very important to understand that the technology is doing analysis of the data that you are providing. It's not just the chat GPT back and forth. Right, you are able to ask it to analyze large volume of data, gather some insight from it, and then build it into your larger solutions. The last one that I want to show you is summarization, right? And this you may have already been using some of you, but I want to show you from scenarios where we actually have. Uh, I already showed you. Let me just refresh this. Oops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some files, and and this is typical for scenarios like you know so i have i have a couple of files from you know microsoft microsoft's uh, uh you know uh, annual report from last year uh and the shareholder letter and what i can actually do is is maybe choose both of them and say i don't have the time to read all of it right please summarize these two files for me and tell me what is it that in in that content right imagine if you have hundreds of such files right a uh, similar kind of a processing that I'm showing you out here just for two files can be enabled for hundreds of those files, output generated, maybe create into some kind of a wiki uh, that summarizes it for your executive summary, and then have a link back to the actual document if you're looking at providing a more information to that. So while, while it is generating, uh this is the this is the portal just so that you know i just uh, downloaded publicly available information if you were to operate the same on your proprietary data which is within your organization the next demo that i'll show you is how you will be able to limit it to uh data that is stored within your organization in your uh environment so this is what it does right it's if i, if I show you the document i believe i have the document open this is the annual report. It's 93 pages, right? Certainly don't have the time and and the and the, and the um, right. What it is able to do it is give it to me in three four paragraphs the key items, right? It discusses the major challenges faced in the world, blah blah blah. Uh, Microsoft is committed. Microsoft also focused on that, and then it also had the letter where it again summarizes the letter even further, which I think was a three or four pages letter. Uh, out there. I mean, I'm just showing you a capability that can be extended to a full fledged enterprise solution, which we are already working with uh, R&D documents, complex um, healthcare and and uh, manufacturing documents, which have a lot of uh, complex jargon, right? How do you actually simplify it? How do you summarize it for people to start understanding uh, this? That's that's a very, very powerful capability that you can bring in out here. Uh, you know, these are also possible to do in. One of the things that I think we talked about is uh, text below, maybe in Spanish, right? Uh, you're looking at making it global. So I have the English version, but I, my English probably is not great in terms of understanding all the complexity. I just want the summarization that I'm doing uh, to be exactly created in Spanish, that's also this entire processing that we have built uh, can do is understand that you want the summary output in Spanish and it's able to generate that output. I'll give it a few seconds uh, while it does that. And then we have five more minutes for uh, another uh, couple of demos that I want to show you. So this capability of processing documents, as we call it information insights, right? Is important to consider for uh, enterprise solutions, even for 
ISV solutions. Uh, the first demo that I showed you, maybe you have hundreds and thousands of uh, files of code, legacy code. You generate documentation out of it. Then you use this solution to actually analyze that document and maybe query that particular document for specific thing. Tell me where is the login functionality? What is the login functionality doing? So that's the complete sort of the workflow. That's the complete sequence that we will suggest how you will be able to uh, look at that different demos. So while this is doing, uh, let me just, I'm just going to wait for 10 more seconds. If not, then I'll move on to the next part. Probably taking more time to do conversion to Spanish or. Hey, Vinny, while while you wait, I don't know if you want to take another question. Yeah, why would um, we take a question while I'm waiting? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so there's a question here. I don't think you've addressed it yet. Please tell me if I'm wrong. But the question is, what are the latency considerations we need to keep in mind with speech to text or text to speech with LLMs, GPT or Azure OpenAI? Did you, do you feel like you've yeah, addressed no, think, that I adequately? Think that's, a, that's, a, that's a very important question. And I think it, it does uh, require um you know a, a lot more uh, in depth discussion um, okay. i think um, uh, we will need to understand specifics around the scenario um you know for any of these technologies um, the demos that i'm showing you uh, at this point in time are more focused on uh, text and text processing not speech processing but we'll be happy to have a follow up conversation um uh, from the gentleman who has asked the question about how yeah so what I, for fair enough so what i would suggest is uh if you want to continue the discussion offline you can send us yep. an email at marketing at winwire.com and i will get that question to vineet and we'll, we'll get you an answer offline or set up a Correct. conversation to talk further Correct. great all right uh i'm going to move on uh Seems like this is taking time, uh, but uh, we'll 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 come back to that. Um, these are some of the demos that I want to show you for the technologies that Fuad covered, uh, the use cases that we see them. As I said, these are all building block solution accelerator that we will, of course, look at uh, uh, leveraging for building an enterprise solution. Right? Uh, we have architecture, um, you know, created for each one of them. Uh, how do you do code processing? As I talked about. Uh, these slides will be available to you. Uh, this recording will be available to you so you can look at it. One important point that I want to emphasize on this is while Azure OpenAI services, which is the generative AI technology capability that we are leveraging for a lot of it, it does not work in isolation. It's not just like a chat interface. You have to have other important services that most of them are already being used in any enterprise solution uh, to secure your keys, right? The key walls, right? Authentication. Uh, all these solutions that I'm showing you are not public solutions. They are authenticated. They are in our corporate environment. It's not that anybody can access it. Uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring the performance of it, right? Uh, in fact, Azure OpenAI has inbuilt monitoring in addition to uh, other uh, scenarios uh, following the entire devops li life cycle right i showed you content safety uh, implementing some policies uh, that you may want to all these other services are very very critical and important as you're envisioning a complete solution and that is important for you to uh, realize that that's how you should be building uh, the actual uh, solution leveraging all these other services um, I already showed you the co code processing and the conversion. Uh, you know, for the conversion, conversion we of course can do from different languages to different languages. Uh, we also have the information inside that I talked about, which again emphasizes these are, as you saw, I'm just showing you a demo version. In real life, you should be containerized, containerizing it. You should be looking at leveraging some of the other cognitive services that you will need, like form recognizers and vision and speech uh, for your scenarios that uh, are, are specific to your uh, organization. I'm going to take the next uh, probably five minutes uh, before we open up for more questions uh, on on a couple of more scenarios. As you look at the document processing that I showed you, right? Uh, how do you build a complete app using that enterprise data, right? Where you can process, you can even search, analyze, uh, a, a, a huge library of documentation that you may currently have, or you may have generated it from the, for example, the code that we just talked about it. 
Uh, the second scenario that, as I said, we will be covering a lot more uh, in the next webinar because of the amount of information that we have to cover is more around Copilot. But I want to give you a sneak peek of what an enterprise application will look like if it is infused by uh, with Gen AI technologies. So this is a solution accelerator again in the Azure marketplace called Knowledge Fusion. Uh, essentially, I'm just going to give you a one line def definition of what the um, Knowledge Fusion solution is. It's basically integrating your internal or external and external data sources and then provide a conversational interface rather than a search interface or working with that particular data. It has additional services that have been built in and it provides recommendations and additional insights on that particular information. The architecture diagram is uh, there. It has OpenAI as OpenAI services as one of the key components, but there are other services being used behind the scene, including the vector database uh, that is the latest addition to the Azure Cognitive Search, which is where enriched documents are stored in a vector mode. And that is very, very important for uh, you know LLMs to process these documents in a much faster and a much more efficient manner. Uh, just to show you an example of you know how this ex how this solution will look like. This is again a solution accelerator that we can bring it to you. Uh, instead of doing some searching, you are asking a question. This is an HR example, uh, for example, uh, that I am asking uh, now instead of giving you a set of links, it's actually giving you the answer of what you were asking for. In this case, Sarah is asking for uh, what is the process for requesting time off? It does point you where are those you know, um, um, actual policies, which you can, if you are interested, you can go read again, or maybe you know use the summarization to summarize it, which it has already done it for you. And it also is suggesting you some other information that you may be interested in, uh, right? So you can also look at more information, more documents that are there uh, related to it. You can look at the actual document if you're interested in. It'll give you a summary of that document. As I said, we are we have basically combined a lot of those features that we talked about as individual solution accelerators into one complete enterprise solution. I can also look at asking uh, a, a follow up question, right? Uh, and then it will. Uh, specifically answer your questions around that and it's all happening in the controlled environment of your enterprise data only right and then i can continue to switch over to okay this is fine but how do i submit an expense report right think of the time saving you could achieve for onboarding newer employees by doing certain things like these um, providing direct information to the uh, employees on on what is it that they're looking at, including IT support, right? Uh, all of these informations. Now, in this particular case, for example, it's not only a document, but it knows that there is there are a couple of videos also uh, that are stored somewhere on the IT portal that it's pointing to that you could actually go and how to uh, fix the VPN DNS resolution problems, uh, some of those things, right? Uh, marketing material, right? Uh, so it's not again PDF or videos, this is a multi-model example of presentation, videos, PDFs, everything is can be uh, provided as a, as a citation. But I'm still providing a very specific response back, which is the capability of generative AI. And again, I can continue going on, but different scenarios. One last demo that I want to show you is uh, what we will be covering, as I said, the technology behind it uh, in the next webinar next week is all around Copilot. Uh, while Microsoft has built Copilot into the core product, each of the products, you can also build Copilot for your own application solution. So uh, there is a complex architecture. We'll dive deeper into this in the next session, uh, in the next uh, webinar. But if you have an application like this, what you see on the left side, right? what you will be able to build is a chat-based interface right, to work with that particular application. right? Think of the time savings you can have in training people how to use an application uh, on the on the adoption, or ease of adoption. So uh, I'm just going to build through this and and talk about it. It's actually a text-based question that I'm asking. Show me available service slot for tomorrow. I I could have done all of that by selecting my drop down this and that, but 
it is able to jump over, change the UI of the application to actually show you right different kind of information that you're asking for, right? And you can continue to build that you want to book an appointment. Yes, I want to book an appointment. Uh, it actually asks for a win number, which of course you have to supply. It does that. It makes a query back into the database, picks up the information you for that win number, and then able to say, okay, I'm also going to orchestrate a lot of this other information around the valet, around the ranger. Uh, what is it that uh, this service is for? And actually create a request right back in the system to schedule a service for this particular vehicle, right? The idea behind this is how you are able to have a chat-based interface. Now, this is, in this particular case, more of a employee of the automaker who is doing that. As the technology matures, as you feel more comfortable, think of it being available to your end customer itself. Right? You could actually make it available to the uh, uh, external user to actually schedule their own service without so many of these, of course, information. They don't need to know about other services, but you can actually do that, right? Uh, here is another example of, you know, there's a test drive that is already there, but I want to uh, reschedule it. It's again going to search based on a phone number. It finds a slot. It asks you, do you want to do that? And you're able to do that in a much, much faster fashion rather than doing it in the particular application itself. Folks, that brings us to um, you know close to of our, our of our this particular session. As I talked about, uh, some of the demos that I've shown you are part of the library of applications and solutions that we have published in the Azure Marketplace. I will encourage you to go there, have a look at them, let us know how we can help you. If you don't know about Winwire, I'll hand it over back to Joe to give you an introduction about Winwire. And thank you again for uh, spending time with us. And, and hopefully this was a good utilization of your time to understand what generative AI can do for your enterprise. Thank, thank you, Vineet, and thank you, Fouad. I think um, my, my mature, very detailed analysis of whether this was uh, engaging is the fact that uh, we really didn't lose anybody um, <laughs> throughout the almost 85 minutes that you both have been presenting. So people were engaged. Um, this is obviously a, a topic that is fluid, dynamic, always changing. Um, and so we look forward to your session next week um, and, and future sessions that we're planning. One around responsible AI will be published sh shortly. But, you know, in terms of uh, who we are, Winwire, Vineet is a co-founder, started the company a little over 16 years ago. Uh, we are a Microsoft partner, multi-award winning partner of the year finalist. Um, we like to say we help clients unleash the power of Azure and, of course, generative AI, as you've heard over the last 85 minutes. Some of our areas of expertise are there. Um, please follow us on LinkedIn, um, where you can get up to speed on, on everything about us and future conversations like the one we just had. And, of course, you can always check us out on winwire.com. Um, Vineet and Foad both alluded to a webinar that they will be conducting next week, August 22nd, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern, uh, double clicking on co-pilot frameworks. So uh, please register if you haven't already. We will send out a recording of this in, a, in an email over the next 48 hours. And as I said, we were actually planning um, and are finalizing a the next conversation after the co-pilot framework conversation next week, and it'll be centered around responsible AI. So you guys help validate that that is a topic that's uh, first and foremost on your mind. So um, any questions that we did not get to today, um, there's our website, there's our email. Um, let's continue the conversation, and we hope um, many of you will join us next week. Fawad and Vinny, thank you see, so much. I do see one more question um, that I think has been asked again. And and um, the gentleman that is asking, we'll be happy to take it offline and provide you some more guidance on the quotas and how does customer implement token limitations. Uh, there are programmatic ways to do that. 
um, that you can do that. But as I was showing you, there are platform uh, is providing that. But we'll, we'll need to understand the requirements a little bit better. What is it that you're trying to do uh, so that we can help you uh, think through that? Yeah, so Raj, if you're still with us, drop, drop us an email, marketing at Winwire. I monitor that. Um, I'm the CMO, so I monitor that, and I will you know, connect you with Vineet uh, to continue the conversation. Awesome. Everyone, thank you, and uh, we look forward to future discussions. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Fouad, thank you again. Joe, thank you. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Yeah, great thank job, you all. Vineet. Thank yeah, you, guys. Appreciate the partnership. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.